everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes, and today we're talking about rule of thirds. We're continuing on in the composition series that we're doing here. And uh, last time we talked about rule of odds, and one of the things I think you're, you're going to start to see, or one of the things I really hope you're starting to see, is a little bit of crossover between some of these concepts, um, especially the earlier ones where we were talking about line and shape, and how those are going to kind of come into play with some of the more oh, conceptual ideas that we're talking about today, like we talked about rule of space before and rule of thirds now, or excuse me, we talked about the rule of odds, now we're talking about the rule of thirds, rule of space will come next. And these, again, like I said, they're guidelines, okay, so it's really important to understand that they're not rules as in they, every shot you do has to fall within these parameters. They're decisions that you make once you've learned them, once you've practiced them, once you get an understanding of the look and feel that they're going to give you when and is the appropriate time to use them and maybe when is not the appropriate time to use them. So anyway, having said all that, let's talk about rule of thirds today. We have talked about rule of thirds on this, on this podcast before, but it's been several years and you're certainly welcome to go back. It's an earlier episode. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And this is a little bit of a review from that. Um, and and maybe but put into the context of what we're doing with the composition stuff and with our composition blog which if you haven't seen it is compositionstudy.com go check it out uh, but the rule of thirds is this basically uh, we've talked about in here in some of these episodes about figure ground relationships and if you don't remember what that is or you, this is the first episode you're watching the ground is simply the canvas or the area of your picture okay so it's whatever you're going to put in that picture um, I like to think of it as maybe a canvas if you're a painter because that makes more sense because it's hard to define just the two-dimensional space like of a JPEG. But that it's that area. That's the ground. Figure is what you put onto that ground. So it could be your subject. It could be maybe some texture. It could be objects, whatever that is. And so figure ground relationships are very important. If you take the ground and we're going to, I'm going to get on the computer and I'll show you exactly. And I'll draw this out. If you, if you look at your ground and you divide it into thirds, okay, so you're starting to see some of these concepts of you know, balance equating to the number three. If you divide it into three sections evenly, so you draw two lines to divide it into three parts, vertically and horizontally, both, you, you go up and down and then you go left and right. What you're going to do is you're going to have these cross points and what those become are points of interest in the composition. Uh, you don't actually see these lines or these cross points. They're not actually in the composition, but if you mentally apply those and place your subjects on those points and try to play with that, it's going to create a little more balance and a little more interest in your composition in general. Um, I look a lot at the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson for this because I think he's such a classicist in the way that he makes these things happen. I think he's so good at taking this classical view of composition and just really doing a lot with it and putting his own voice and his own stamp on it, which is exactly what he did. And that's his style of composition. It's very classically based. The other fascinating thing uh, that I think there is about uh, Bresson is that you know he did a lot of street photography. so. Sometimes he probably would set things up, but a lot of it was improvised. But the reason he was so good at it is these concepts were in his mind. He was trained this way and he had enough practice and shot millions of pictures to the point where he had a really natural feel for a lot of these rules of composition. But they weren't rules. They were just ingrained in his mind and very naturally flow, flowed between what he was seeing and where to be, where to move the camera, maybe wait for the subject to move into the right position. He was just so gifted at that. So let's go over to the computer and we're going to take a look at some of the rule of thirds examples here. In this first image that I want to look at, this is a W. Eugene Smith from uh, mid 1960s. It's a portrait of a nun or a photo of a nun. And there's a lot of things going on in this image other than what we're going to talk about today, which is rule of thirds. But what I want to do just a second is look at this image. And I hope you guys are starting to see this. You know, we've done several shows in a series on composition techniques now. And I, I hope that you're starting to see that a lot of times you're more than one concept we've talked about is present in any given image and I think that's important and the reason is is you know I think that's all these are tools that are basically at your disposal and as a photographer, you know, or as an artist, you, the decisions that you make around, you know, whether it's a rule concept or if it's just a use of line or shape or, or something that's, you know, contrast, something else we've talked about, it's, it's blending these together that create interest oftentimes in a composition. And there's several things that you can see that are going on in this picture that I think are really worth noting. It's an outstanding photo. Um, also, the fact that, you know, this, this 
is a street type photo. It, it, it looks um, very unposed, very improvised, very off the cuff. You know, when you see guys like W. Eugene Smith or Cartier-Bresson, I mean, this is what blows my mind. And I've said this before on the show that that you know their sensibility to use a lot of these comp- compositional techniques on kind of a subconscious level because they don't have the time when you're composing street photos uh, to sit there and overplan your composition. So it's a really natural ability to employ a lot of these techniques and concepts we've talked about and they do it very naturally um they're very both very gifted photographers in that regard and it's something that you know when we study these it's one thing to set these up in a studio and you know figure it out beforehand it's another thing to be able to improvise and and get a lot of this stuff going on um we've talked about obviously the use of shape and the use of line and as far as shape goes you know obviously what's prominent is and we'll talk about subframing in another another episode here but you have you know obviously the habit in this outfit the nun wears that really naturally frames that up just with some contrast and simple shapes the way the white part frames up her face and which is framed also by the black part of the habit um it's amazing i think the shape of her hand is really important in this uh you know and as far as the background goes this isn't exactly complete negative space but i would call it negative space you can tell that there's a crowd of people back there but there's a low level or low enough level of detail to where it's really not distracting even the figure you make out the most right behind the nun does not distract from the picture and so it's it's uh, it is definitely i think negative space in that regard and and it's not completely negative, but it's certainly low energy, um, and it does not distract from you know. And it's dark enough too to where you know the white part of the habit really makes her stand out and pop. The other thing that's really interesting about this um, that it, it and you probably picked right up on it when you first saw the image is where her eyes are directed. Um, they're looking up. They're looking slightly to her left, um, to our right. And what's interesting is there is an implied line or an implied direction, um, directional sense with this composition. And that's what's important. Uh, we've talked about that before, and I had a lot of questions back where people didn't really understand what implied line meant. Well, this isn't exactly a hard line that's implied, but it's certainly, you could, you know, if her eyes were shooting beams, I know that's really kind of a stupid way of looking at it, but that's what it is. You get a sense of direction that there's something that she's looking at that's above and behind you and the fact that it's a nun uh, you know there's certainly an implication of some kind of spiritual or religious um, direction the way her hand is placed over her mouth and, and maybe amazement or something like that anyway I'm over analyzing it at this point but anyway what I want you to get out of this is a way a lot of the techniques we've talked about so far are starting to all come together within these compositions that we're looking at and I hope that you're starting to see this with photographers that you'd like to see and that stuff that you find that's of interest is that you, you start to see how these concepts are used how they work together to make the picture so how does this work with with rule of thirds okay so rule of thirds we've talked about on here before and so basically if I subdivide horizontally my composition into three sections so essentially you have two lines that make that so you can see there's three shapes three parts two lines so I've divided that into three and then also divide um, um, vertically by three so both directions you're going to get a grid you're going to get a um, cross-section of nine spaces here and within those nine spaces what we're looking at actually is where the lines cross and 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 we have specifically four points of interest see where all these cross sections are there's four of them those are generally in the in the concept of rule of thirds those are defined as your key points of interest Um, they're points of high energy this is where you can create impact in a composition I'm going to also argue, because we're so used to seeing the rule of thirds uh, used in graphic design, in illustration, in painting, in photography, um, it's a very common technique to see people use. I think that what it ends up doing to people of our generation looking at this is it really creates a sense of balance very easily. I think that if you want to get a sense of energy and contrast going, I would actually choose personally not to do something with rule of thirds to create that energy, but that's how it's classically defined, but it does create a sense of balance. Now, the thing is, is you don't have to use all four of these points. In fact, I wouldn't. Sometimes it's easy enough to just use one point of interest and you pick any of the four. Um, sometimes it's easy or, or it, sometimes it's nice to see things where you contrast. So like, you know, you have one of the uh, the uh, higher points and one of the lower points down here that together combine. You see some Bresson's work a lot um, combined to create interest and balance in the photograph. So anyway, so basically if I take away the black background, you can see that in, in this composition, uh, the nun's left eye was the what was placed on that point of interest and that's really important here because that's really what it's a point that defines the composition in some ways um but it's definitely sitting on a point of interest if she was moved towards the center of the image 
this may not have the same impact. In fact, I would argue that it wouldn't. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. And it's not just because it would expose this guy back here. It's just it would it creates more balance in a symmetry kind of way of looking at things, but not uh, balance in terms of thirds like we've looked at before. And remember the rule of odds, this kind of plays with that a little bit. And we've talked about that in the last couple shows too. So moving over to Pinterest now, um, in case you guys aren't aware, um, one of the things I'm doing on these is uh, on my Pinterest account, I'm trying to do all my research online so I can share that with you guys in advance. So you can kind of go into my collection of boards on Pinterest and you can find whatever the next show is going to be or whatever you haven't seen yet and kind of be able to track this as we go along so you can see these images in advance if you like. Um, but anyway, I want to go through and I want to talk about rule of thirds. We looked at the uh, the W. Eugene Smith image. Um, I'm not in Photoshop now, so I'm not going to draw lines for you, but I think based on the last example, you understand that. And you need to start mentally being able to process where these lines are and where those points of interest occur. I think it's fairly obvious in here that it's on the upper right point of interest. So if you were, excuse me, were to divide this image vertically and horizontally, you would have crossing right here where this, this um, wonderful image of a Russian woman where her head is placed um, on the image. What's also interesting is you're starting to see, and we haven't covered the geometry techniques yet, but uh, there's a major triangle that's kind of floating off that's formed by these two benches that you don't see entirely. And we're going to cover uh, geometric concepts pretty soon, too, in the compositional series. But anyway, there's several things that make this such a, a beautiful image. Uh, a couple other things I want to show you. Um, some stuff that's very conventional. Another Brisson. I love this guy with his head on the table. And you can see the bald head, obviously, is right on one of those points of interest. Um, anyway, very quirky, very whimsical, but wonderful image. Uh, this is uh, Arnold Newman, another one of my favorite photographers. This is a portrait of Eugene Smith um, that he made, uh, the man who shot the nun photo we were just looking at. And I love it because, first of all, he's such a wonderful character to look at with the hair and the beard and the, the glasses. And, and also, and Newman did this a lot, is to put the point of interest on one of the lower corners. And, uh, you know, you can see it's pretty much kind of right near his eye right here if you were to subdivide and create those points of interest on this image. And so if you don't understand what I'm talking about, because I'm not drawing them on these images, because I want you to start seeing them mentally, you know, rewind this and watch how we subdivide it again so where you can see where those points are. I think that's really important um, to know. Um, this is uh, Imogene Cunningham, a portrait of Ansel Adams. You can see almost a square format, probably shot on a Hasselblad, something of that nature. You can see that um, the head is placed relatively near one of those points of interest. It's not exactly on it. And I think this is an important point to make as well because you don't always have to be so rigid with it. And I'll get into that in a couple images in just a second. Um, another famous image, this is, well, let's look at the final verse. This is the public excuse me, the Pablo Picasso portrait that Arnold Newman did in the 50s. And you can see that the left eye creates a sense of mystery because of the shadow, excuse me, his right eye, and uh, it is placed on one of those points of interest. What's interesting about this shot, and I couldn't find a bigger image online of this, but this is actually the original. This was a pretty tight crop of the original large format portrait. You could see even in the original portrait, he had placed Picasso's head on one of those points of interest. But I think he found, oh, probably because Picasso was a cubist, um, to box that in a lot tighter just made sense. It made a better portrait, and it spoke more of the type of artist that Picasso was. So I think it's really interesting. And a lot of a lot of the um, contact sheets that that um, Newman had marked up are available in various books and stuff that you can you can see. Um, another classic one. This is Cartier-Bresson. Um, obviously the head of the speaker right on a point of interest. Also you see um, some pretty elaborate symmetry, um, perspective, etc. going on with, with this crowd that's watching him. So this is a great image. It would have had a completely different feel had the speaker been right in the middle of the shot. It still would have been interesting, but I would argue that it's almost it's almost too symmetrical at that point. And I think offsetting that a little bit just creates a little more interest, a little more depth, a little more um, you know, maybe more balance in that composition than you would have if everything were straight on. Now, a couple of these images, I want to show you this one. This is um, the famous surrealist painter Max Ernst, and this was another Arnold Newman portrait. And you can see that the head, or Max's face, and he's smoking, so there's smoke everywhere, it's not right exactly on one of those points of interest in the rule of thirds. And this is a technique that you see sometimes where it's almost like it's too rigid of a composition just to follow straight up rule of thirds. So a lot of times you can pull your subject just off of it a little bit. And you can tell that that point would probably be right here where this black part is. 
and just moving his head down a little bit just creates a slight bit of depth, a slight less obvious nature to it. And I think that's really important. Um, you also see that in, well, here's an Ansel Adams picture. This is um, Autumn Moon from High Sierra. And notice how the moon is actually set off of that point just a little bit. The actual point would probably be somewhere up in here. And I think that's important when it's too obvious. Sometimes just pulling it slightly off axis just a little bit um, creates a little more um, well, it takes away the obvious and it creates a little more balance and a little more interest to it. Um, you know, maybe a little more energy to that composition. And then finally, the uh, famous JFK portrait that Arnold Newman did. I think this image, because you have such a strong perspective that's coming in from the way the building is towering down and the, the angle this is shot at and the, the, the uh, wide angle nature of the lens and JFK's proportion to that, I don't think that Kennedy, if you'd placed his head right on the rule of thirds in this image with this angle, it just seems to flow naturally, even though it's pretty close. And I think that probably a lot of those implied lines from the perspective nature of this, from the, the way the roof hangs down, the way the window lines go, um, that creates a nature to this composition that they kind of point all at that point of interest and I, I don't know I just think it was it, this was a good decision to bring him down plus as we've talked about before when you have subject ground relationships you generally will call more attention to a subject one it's contrasty his dark suit is there's not a lot of light on his face he's actually backlit and two um, he's close to the edge and close to a corner actually and so that's drawing those two elements are drawing a lot of attention to Kennedy and because the proportion of him and proportion of this building is he's pretty small you almost need to bring a little more attention to him so anyway that's been rule of thirds and I think it's really important for you guys to start looking for this in images that you like um, uh, one more I can show you real quick this is uh, Faye Dunaway and Steve McQueen this is a Bill Ray image that was shot and again I th one of the things that I like that he's playing with too are kind of oh the convex concave shapes the way their faces join together there's a you know, kind of a, a flirtatious not even flirtatious it's almost erotic uh, nature of the dynamics between the two of them but these shapes all kind of come together right on a point of interest and I think that's important he didn't put their heads on a point of interest he took a shape that kind of is a notch deeper that you got to look for put that on a point of interest thus making it more obvious and I think that's important but it's really important to look at this stuff in context of the the images that you like to look at um, and start to see these through the camera lens when you're taking pictures um, it's really pretty easy easy to start to get a feel for rule of thirds it's a little less easy to start getting a feel with the, how to make decisions based on like do you pull something right off of that point of interest a little bit well in the case of the moon image you probably yes because there's nothing else there and it becomes a little too obvious when it's right on a point or is it for a reason like this JFK image where you need a little more subject attention than what's going to be given just by the rule of thirds rule of thirds probably would have blended this a little too much so anyway um, hit me up on Facebook Twitter follow me on Pinterest if you want to keep track of this stuff and uh, that's about it for this time so so we will see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching.